Welcome to our webinar Wednesday on the topic of sleep. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Tori Carter, and I am a programs manager for Can Do MS. And I'd like to take a quick moment to thank the sponsors of this program. And before we get started, I would like to point out some functions of Zoom that you can utilize during this program. So we have the chat box where you guys can interact with each other as well as provide comments and engage with the speakers. And then we have our Q&A box where you can submit your questions that we can get to the Q&A at the end of the program. And then you can also utilize the show captions feature if you'd like to um, activate closed captioning in the program. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers that we have this evening. We have Abby Hughes, a psychologist from Maryland, and Samantha Domingo, a psychologist from Oregon. And um, thank you guys both for being here, and I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Story. We're very happy to be here and um, getting to talk to you all about one of our favorite topics. Next slide, please. So here's our plan for this evening. Um, first, we want to talk a little bit about the basics of what healthy sleep and what a healthy sleep pattern is. Um, we also want to talk about the physical and emotional factors that can impact sleep. We will go over uh, the impact of poor sleep on health and wellness. And then most importantly, we're going to learn some tips um, for more effective night sleep. So the short answer is that it actually depends. Um, so a lot of you were correct, actually, the majority of you in that um, most adults require uh, anywhere between eight hours, sometimes nine hours of sleep. But we find that these are just averages and sleep needs actually depend on a lot of different factors. For example, your age. Um, so as you know, uh, as we are young and growing, we end up needing more sleep. Um, so for example, babies and young children end up needing more sleep than adults. Um, oh, can you go back to the previous slide? <laughs> yeah, it was a trick question. You're right. <laughs> um, other things like genetics, uh, so what your natural circadian rhythm patterns are. I'm sure a lot of you may have heard of things like, oh, I'm a night owl or I'm a morning lark. Um, a lot of us fall somewhere in between, but that can also impact um, how much sleep uh, you need and how much sleep you get. Um, and then behaviors, of course, the less active we are, um, that can also impact uh, our sleep at night and things like environment and culture, um, depending on where you're from. There are many cultures that um, actually value things like long naps in the afternoon and later bedtimes. Uh, so all of this influences how much sleep we get. And um, yeah, before we uh, jump into this, I just wanted to add um, that um, it, it's very individual. So I think not getting hung up on, I need this specific number of hours of sleep because otherwise I'm going to get sick. It's, you know, there's a lot of alarming information out there and, and what may be enough for some people may not be enough for you and, and vice versa. So it's really important to take into account your own individual needs. Um, and we'll talk about um, how we know what, you know, enough sleep feels like later on in the webinar. All right, next slide. So I wanted to dive a little bit into the science of sleep. Um, you may have learned about this before in some of our previous webinars, but if you're seeing this for the first time, um, this picture that you see here depicts the two process model of sleep regulation. So basically this is what makes sleep happen in your body. So the first process we'll call process S and it stands for sleep drive. Um, so the idea is that the longer you are awake, the sleepier you get over time, right? So a lot of us, you know, if we are in that, you know, seven to nine hour um, hours of sleep per night, we end up needing about, you know, 14, 16, 17 hours of wake time to again, gain enough sleep drive to be able to fall asleep at night. 
Um, another way to think about this is sleep hunger, right? Uh, so the longer you go without food, the hungrier you get um, over time. And then if you end up having, for example, a big meal, then it can take a little bit longer for you to feel hungry again. Um, the same thing happens with sleep. If you take a really long nap in the afternoon, what that does is that cuts into your sleep drive at night and you may find it a little harder to fall asleep. The other process, and these two, by the way, work independently, but they work best when they're aligned, is our process C or our circadian rhythm. And this is another word that, you know, you may have heard before. And circadian rhythm is basically our timekeeper, right? So it lets our body know when it's time to be awake and when it's time to be asleep. Um, so it pushes for wakefulness during the day and then at night. It involves some, a lot of processes, which we don't have to get into, but for example, the release of melatonin, um, which is regulated by light. And um, I'm sure you've all heard the rules, right, about not, no screens at night and avoiding blue light in the evening. Um, the reason behind this tip and this, this strategy is that we actually require darkness for melatonin to release. And blue light impacts our ability to absorb, um, to actually release that melatonin at night. So you may end up staying awake longer than you wanted to. Um, any questions on that? I'm going to check the chat real quick, just so that I don't move too fast on this. Okay. So in conclusion, sleep drive, sleep hunger, the longer you're awake, the sleepier you get. Circadian rhythm, our internal clock, regulated by light signals that get into a part of your brain that then tells the rest of your body what to do so that sleep can happen. Sleep is more successful when these two items are aligned. So for example, you may find that when you travel um, to a different time zone, your body may have a little bit of a harder time adjusting, and that's what we call jet lag. Uh, the same thing can happen artificially if we have different schedules throughout the week. For example, people who work throughout the week and then on weekends sleep in. That can also set off um, a type of artificial jet lag. So, all right. Let's move on to the next question, and I'll leave that to... Uh, Abby, wait, and I got a question from Monica. So reviewing uh, one cell phone keeps your mind working and causes sleep difficulty. Yeah, it can, um, especially if you do it at night. Um, at night, what we really want to do is avoid bright lights, um, including the light from your phone. And that's both because it affects your brain's melatonin production and also because what we're doing on our phone tends to be alerting, right? We check our email, we scroll through so social media, we look at the news, et cetera. And so that can keep our brain really engaged. Um, so we'll talk about some tips uh, that relate to this in a little bit of um, uh, time. You're welcome, Cheryl. All right, I'll leave it to Abby to move on to our next poll question. Sure. And I'll just jump in here too with um, a few of the questions that came in through the chat. Um, for folks whose poll just came up, go ahead and answer the poll. Um, we'll go over those results and then I'll answer some of the questions that came through the Q&A. Um, but what is a normal amount of nighttime wakenings? I know someone had asked the question about how do you get back to sleep when you wake up in the middle of the night? Um, but this acknowledges the fact that nighttime wakenings happen and they particularly happen in the context of MS. So go ahead and give it, give it a guess of what's a normal amount of nighttime awakenings. Okay, and it looks like about uh, almost 70% of you said a few, meaning three to four of a few brief awakenings are normal. That is absolutely correct. So a lot of you have already been studying up on your sleep education, which is great. We can, we can jump off with some more details from there. Um, but I, th I think the thing to highlight here is that all of us do wake up um, often several times during the night, usually not for too long of a period of time. And that's that's what may be considered a healthy uh, amount. All right. Um, I'll pause here just to address some of the questions that came through the Q&A. Uh, a lot of questions have come in regarding blue light and whether blue light from screens like a Kindle or an iPhone, uh, a TV, et cetera, if that 
you know, the question is, is blue light more harmful than other types of light in terms of dysregulating sleep? Do I need to wear special glasses to filter out blue light? Um, this is still a fairly new area of research. And some of the, what we call the effect sizes, the, the effects of what makes a significant difference in sleep um, is still to be determined. What was already said in the chat is that what's likely happening is the screen itself and your brain being alert and engaged with an activity is really more of the driving issue, more so than say the type of light or how bright the light is. Um, and so if you do find that, you know, wearing the glasses cr creates less eye strain, for example, and then you can more easily fall asleep, um, that may be something you you may want to try. But the idea of the blue light being inherently so harmful that it's contributing significantly to insomnia or sleep disturbance, um, th that area of research is really just emerging now. And it's, it's potentially uh, more helpful to think about it in terms of what is your brain actively doing that may be keeping you awake. Um, so we'll talk more about that from a behavioral standpoint, since Sam and I are both psychologists and we focus on the behavioral aspects of sleep management. Um, so within the context of adult sleep, um, we know that a few brief, brief awakenings, brief meaning less than 20 minutes or so, is normal and a part of a regular sleep cycle pattern. Um, we go through several cycles of sleep per night, and when we get into that more shallow phase of sleep, we're more likely to wake up from sounds, um, like the noisy neighbors that someone mentioned in the chat, um, or uh, even if we have like a, a muscle spasm or a twitch or a pain, we're more likely to wake up during that more shallow period of sleep. The trick is about trying to find a way to get back uh, to sleep while minimizing stress and not, quote, trying to sleep. So as soon as you find yourself putting a lot of effort into trying to get back to sleep, um, you may be in a, in a bit of a losing battle because as soon as you're trying to sleep, it's uh, increasing your cortisol and your alertness and you're likely to be getting frustrated. Um, so awakenings happen due to many different uh, conditions, many different reasons. Um, the, there's medical, uh, conditions, including sleep disorders, depression, and anxiety. Um, uh, there's behavioral factors such as nutrition, hydration, and how you're coping with that. Um, and then there's environmental factors like having a bed partner who, uh, might snore very loud, or they may have their own sleep disturbance, uh, children, other noises. So the degree to which you may be able to control or manage some of those factors may differ depending on your individual situation. So we want to get back to basics in terms of what does typical sleep look like. Um, throughout the night, as I mentioned, there's several different phases of sleep. And so when we're in a more shallow phase of sleep, um, if you look to the image on your right, looking at the sleep circle, um, we go through cycles of sleep where we go from shallow sleep to deep sleep and then back up to shallow sleep and then down to deep sleep. And over the course of the night, this may be why you consistently wake up, for example, at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Um, and unless there's a train that's going by your window right at those times, which actually may be the case for some people, um, it's if you find yourself waking up at a consistent time each night, it's likely due to being in that lighter phase of sleep. And that's when we're more likely to wake up due to uh, physical symptoms like uh, our bladder being full. Um, we go through each stage of sleep uh, in, in different amounts and the overall cycles and the time that we spend in that deep sleep gets less and less over the course of the night. So if you find yourself more likely to wake up at say like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., that's likely because you're spending less time in the deep sleep and more time in that um, closer to the wakefulness sleep. And it's actually more time in REM sleep where we have the most vivid dreams. Um, so if we, if you wake up and you, you wake up from a really wacky dream, it's probably because you were in REM sleep and that tends to be later in the night um, or earlier in the morning, depending on how you look at it. Um, this, if we think about the purpose of this, this sort of served a survival function for us as a species that if we, you know, we, we don't want to be in deep, deep sleep the whole night. Uh, if we were in that deep sleep, we wouldn't wake up if, for example, there was a predator or a threat. Uh, so we try to get that deep sleep kind of out of the way sooner in the, the night and then 
have the more shallow sleep as the night progresses. Um, that certainly doesn't mean that it's not also frustrating when you do wake up at 4 a.m. and you can't get back to sleep. And we'll talk about some strategies for managing that. So the reality is that, yes, sleep impacts your brain health in both positive and negative ways, depending on the quality of your sleep. Um, the thing is that we all have poor sleep from time to time. I know that there's a lot of alarming information ab out there about um, links of poor sleep with uh, health consequences down the road. And especially when we get into MS, we, you know, we hear this all the time. Sleep is so important. Um, what's important to recognize is, especially as we get older, this becomes more common. Um, and uh, we can talk about the reasons why that happens. Um, and, you know, one to two nights of poor sleep per week isn't likely to cause any significant harm. Um, it's when it becomes more of a chronic issue, uh, what we call chronic insomnia or difficulty sleeping, um, that can happen, you know, up, you know, at least three times a week, uh, for, um, at least three months. That's when we tend to, uh, qualify that as more chronic. Um, the other side of this is that actual worry about sleep, worrying about how much sleep you're not getting or, uh, worrying about the quality of your sleep can sometimes be more harmful um, than the poor sleep itself. Like think about how many times you have woken up in the middle of the night and started worrying about, oh, you know, if I go to sleep right now, I'm only going to get this many hours of sleep. Um, and then tomorrow is going to be really difficult and my pain is going to be worse. Um, so that creates what we call essentially sleep anxiety, anxiety about sleep. A lot of people who have poor sleep will actually dread nighttime because they're afraid of what kind of night they're going to have. Um, and so that anxiety that's ongoing can create more problems than the poor sleep itself. So it's a balancing act, right? Um, working with your medical team is super important um, and taking the approach of being a detective, um, figuring out what's going on, what can be done. There's a lot of really effective um, treatment options out there. Um, and I saw somewhere on the chat, somebody mentioned menopause. There's a lot of life things that can get in the way other than MS. So it's important to, uh, look at all these different angles. Um, and you know, what happens when, um, you feel you know, you end up encountering frustration um, at the lack of sleep or frustration because you, you know, you are having these long awakenings in the, in the middle of the night, um, you know, how do we cope with that, with that loss of sleep? Uh, so we'll, we'll give some tips on that as we, as we go on. Okay. So getting into the specifics around whether MS can cause poor sleep, um, the, the answer is maybe, maybe not. Um, certainly there are a lot of factors related to MS that could be driving your sleep disturbance, um, but it might not be specifically related to MS. So let's talk a little bit about what are the MS-related factors that do contribute to poor sleep. Um, first would be lesions in the brain. So if we think of what are the, the hallmark factors of an MS diagnosis are demyelinating lesions in the brain. Um, depending on how many lesions someone has and where the lesions are located, that could be driving some sleep disturbance. There's um, two particular structures that are really important for regulating your internal clock. So that circate, there's a circadian clock located in the brain um, in an area called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, you won't be tested on that name later. But that if you happen to have a lesion in that area, that could potentially disrupt your circadian rhythm. There's also um, your brainstem is very, very involved in sleep regulation um, in terms of your alertness and also your breathing during sleep. And so if you happen to have a brainstem lesion um, or a stroke in the brainstem, uh, people who've had MS-related lesions or strokes in that area tend to experience some disruption in sleep because it affects the way that their breathing is happening in sleep as well. Um, so that's, a, that's one potential basic biologic cause of sleep issues. 
Um, another would be due to the overall volume of the brain, those lesions over time or neurodegeneration over time, so shrinking of the brain, um, can also alter how our neurotransmitters and our neurohormones function. Um, so for example, melatonin, um, while it circulates through the whole body, um, the, the impact of different neurohormones on brain function and sleep can also uh, lead to some sleep issues. Um, and then there's a whole host of MS symptoms like pain, nocturia, which is urination at night or increased urination at night, um, are, are also factors that can uh, interfere with sleep. Fatigue during the day can also interfere with sleep. If you find yourself taking long naps or uh, a large number of naps during the day to manage your fatigue, and then that decreases the sleep drive that Sam had talked about earlier. Um, our behaviors are also very, very strongly linked to how well we sleep and how we cope with symptoms. Um, and so, for example, if we cope with pain or if we cope with sleep issues in bed by staying in bed awake and trying to will ourselves to sleep for hours on end um, with no luck and we and we keep getting frustrated over that, that's, that's a behavior that is counteractive to sleep. It actually can get in the way of sleep. Um, if we spend most of our time worrying or planning our day while in bed, so doing things in bed that are not sleep conducive also makes us have um, a negative association between our bed and sleep, which also makes it hard to generate sleep. So we'll talk about some more behavioral factors later in this talk, um, but going through some other uh, factors here, medications. So uh, there are a lot of symptomatic medications that could potentially affect your circadian rhythm, your sleep drive, um, being sleepy during the day, for example, uh, due, to due to pain medication, for example. Um, so asking your doctor that if, particularly if you're taking more than three medications, which is what we often consider what's called polypharmacy, um, you may have different interactions of medications that could be a factor that you would want to ask your prescriber about of how can you manage your medications and the timing of your medications uh, to optimize your sleep so that you're getting uh, good sleep when you want to get good sleep. Um, and then there may be pre-existing or exacerbating factors like childbirth. Um, no one, very few people are sleeping well um, in the first few months of postpartum uh, for, for childcare reasons. Um, menopause is another significant change in sleep. Um, and, and then the pandemic, uh, if we just think about over the past three years, uh, changing of lifestyle, changing of schedule, changing how much time we spend indoors versus outdoors. Um, these are all things that can significantly affect our sleep health. Um, one question that arises is, are sleep disorders more common in MS? Uh, and there are a handful, there are a large number of sleep disorders if you, if you look in the diagnostic manual of, of sleep disorders. Um, there are some disorders that are particularly more common in MS due to the factors that we just talked about. Um, so insomnia or difficulty falling or staying asleep uh, is about twice as common in MS compared to the general population, um, or two to three times more common. Um, hypersomnolence, so that's actually sleeping too much. And I, I saw a question in the chat about how much sleep is too much sleep. Uh, it, it seems like you could sleep for hours and hours and hours and still not feel refreshed. Um, that may be a, a symptom of hypersomnolence, which is if you're sleeping more than 10 hours a day and you're also not feeling refreshed and it feels like you could keep sleeping and still not feel um, uh, re refreshed from an energy standpoint, that could be hypersomnolence. Um, narcolepsy is also more common in people with, with MS and that involves some uncontrollable lapses into sleep. Uh, Sleep-related breathing difficulties like sleep apnea is also very common, and that's because when there's uh, neuronal damage or when there's damage to the brain through lesions or neurodegeneration, that can also affect breathing during sleep, and it can affect the, the muscles that are coordinated in keeping your um, chin in position and your laryngeal muscles in position, that those can collapse overnight if, if those muscles become weak, and that can generate sleep apnea. Um, and then there also may be some abnormal movements uh, or behaviors during sleep. So it's important that if you are having difficulty with sleep, um, not only to tell your provider that you can or can't sleep or you're waking up at X time or Y time, but also to describe in as much detail as you can the nature of the difficulty. So if you're having some breathing difficulties, if you tend to wake up at the same time, 
Um, if you have a bed partner who notices your body twitching uh, during the night, or if it looks like you're acting out your dreams, those are all really important and helpful um, observations to bring to your neurologist or to your healthcare provider uh, to determine what kind of sleep disorder you could potentially have. And if it's related to MS or um, potentially, you know, unfortunately MS uh, and a sleep disorder could be also unrelated. Um, so I want to give an example of a common uh, presentation of insomnia. Uh, so one of the most common sleep disorders, and we'll, we'll call this person Patricia. Um, she will say she's a 56 year old woman diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS about 15 years ago. Um, and her disease course has currently been stable on a DMT or disease modifying therapy. This means that she has not had any recent relapses. Um, but she does have a fair number of MS symptoms that fluctuate from time to time, uh, including neuropathic pain. So this is nerve pain in her feet and hands and daily fatigue. Uh, she retired due to MS and she takes a, a 90 minute nap sometime during the 2 to 5 p.m. window. She gets into bed around 9 p.m., watches TV, goes on social media on her phone, and then tries to fall asleep around 10, but finds that she's tossing and turning until about 1 or 2 a.m., um, and she's been waking about uh, four or five nights uh, a week for the past few years. So she's been dealing with this insomnia for quite some time. Next slide, please. Um, and so if we look at Patricia's sleep chart, if you were to work with a sleep provider um, like myself or like uh, Dr. Domingo, you, you would likely first be asked to create a sleep diary where you would be tracking the time that you're awake and the time that you're asleep. Um, and in this particular graph, the dark blue color is time awake and the light blue color is time spent asleep. And so for Patricia, you can see that she's in bed around nine, um, trying to fall asleep around 10, but she's still awake until about one or 2 a.m., gets a few hours of sleep, wakes up again, gets another hour, wakes up again, and, and is really trying, trying, right, to, to extend her sleep into that morning. Um, if we add up her time in bed, she's spending about 12 hours in bed, but the time spent asleep is only about five hours. So uh, a behavioral sleep specialist may do a calculation with your sleep diary or with your sleep chart to generate something called sleep efficiency. And that's essentially the percentage of how much time you're in bed versus how much time you're spending asleep. Um, and so for Patricia, she was at 42%. In general, we wanna shoot for about 85% sleep efficiency. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of tips to improve sleep and reduce insomnia, in the case of Patricia, um, we might start by trying to set a schedule where she's waking up and getting out of bed at the same time every day. Um, and it's important to also not gauge our wake time based on how we feel immediately after waking. So sometimes you'll hear the question of, do you feel refreshed when you wake up? I don't really like that question because, um, and I'm going to uh, actually steal uh, uh, Samantha Domingo's analogy here, um, because when we fall asleep, it's usually a more gradual process, like a light is dimming down. And the same way when we're waking up, it's like gradually dimming the light to gra gradually start to wake up again. Um, very few people wake up with the alarm, rearing to go, feeling like, gosh, I just feel so refreshed upon awakening because our body takes some time to adjust. Um, so I, Sam, I appreciate that analogy here. Um, we also don't want to get into bed uh, until we're actually feeling sleepy, which is not the same thing as saying tired or fatigued. Um, a lot of you have put comments into uh, the chat about fatigue, right? And, and I, I hear so much how fatigue is different than sleepiness. Um, so really trying to only get into bed when you're actually feeling sleepy, like you can't keep your eyes open anymore. Um, someone had asked about, you know, uh, they want to be able to read in bed and they find that they get so sleepy that they fall asleep right away. Well, that actually means that you have really good what's called stimulus control. Your bed is a great symbol or a great trigger for sleep for you. So if you want to be able to read, uh, having a different place to read other than in your bed, maybe at a chair next to your bed, may be a strategy so that you're not becoming so sleepy. Um, 
a big strategy here is getting out of bed if you can't sleep after about 20 minutes. Um, so that gets into what we were talking about earlier of not trying so hard to sleep or not trying to make it happen, um, but rather giving your, your body a chance. And if it doesn't fall asleep right away, we need a reset. We want to get out of bed so that our brain is not associating bed with alertness or bed with being frustrated. Um, but do keep in mind safety. So if you have uh, mobility concerns, if you use a wheelchair or if you need assistance getting in and out of bed, create a plan where you have someone or um, something to help you get out of bed or use that uh, that walker or the cane or whatever you need um, to be able to get out of bed safely. Um, and we want to use the bed only for the three S's, uh, sleep, sex, and sickness. Um, other than those three S's, trying to keep other activities outside of the bed will really help with that, what's called stimulus control. Um, we also want to be strategic with naps. I think someone had asked, when is the best time to take a nap or how long should a nap be? Think about that sleep drive that Sam showed earlier in the talk. Your sleep drive increases over the course of the day. Every time you take a nap and how long you take a nap, uh, it's like letting the air out of that balloon. You're not going to have as strong of a sleep drive. So keeping the nap shorter allows you to maintain that sleep drive so that you can fall asleep better at night. Um, and then finally, we want to create a buffer zone or a quiet time before bed. Um, in the same way that that dimmer switch analogy worked for getting up, it also works for quieting our mind and quieting our body at night. Um, because very few of us can go from, again, working, being around our kids, our spouses, um, you know, cooking dinner, reading a book or watching um, reality TV and, you know, getting all excited about you know, the drama and the reality TV um, and then immediately put your head on the pillow and fall asleep. It's just not really likely to happen. Um, so we want to create a wind down time to create that buffer zone. A uh, few more uh, tips and tricks, turning the clock around. So trying to avoid clock watching is also a helpful strategy. Uh, limiting caffeine or stimulants. So this may be a question for your provider if you happen to take a medication that is a stimulant-based medication. Uh, for caffeine and coffee, the half-life of caffeine is quite long. So it's about eight hours for half of the caffeine to be excreted by your body. So if you drink... Uh, coffee at 3 p.m. Um, eight hours later, about only half of that has been excreted. Um, so thinking about timing any kind of caffeine use for earlier in the day and cutting yourself off in that mid-afternoon point. We also want to limit alcohol um, and, and avoid alcohol three hours before bedtime. And that's because while alcohol can make you feel sleepy, it is a it's what we would say is more of a sedating um element as opposed to a sleep inducing element. And sedation is not the same thing as sleep. Um, it, if you look at a graph of someone's sleep when they are under the influence of alcohol, um, even not to a point of intoxication, uh, their sleep uh, rhythm looks different. Their sleep staging looks different. Uh, we also want to exercise regularly, but avoid cardio two to three hours before bedtime because that gets our heart rate up, gets that cortisol going. We want to try to avoid things that get the heart rate up close to bedtime. Uh, we want to keep our bedroom quiet, dark, comfortable, and cool. Um, I saw a, a mention in the chat about some noisy neighbors. Um, if, if you can't always control the bedroom, um, trying, to con trying to manage your own body, so investing in some solid earplugs or um, listening to white noise uh, may also help drown out some of that external noise. Um, avoiding heavy meals before bedtime and trying to expose yourself to sunlight first thing in the morning uh, if you're able to and avoiding the electronics closer to, bed to bedtime. Okay. Um, so with Patricia, uh, we created a relaxation buffer time for her outside of bed um, where she did some quiet reading until about 11. Uh, she was then able to fall asleep by 1130 because instead of spending that, those three or four hours in bed trying to force herself to sleep, um, she created that relaxation period. She felt herself getting sleepy and then was able to get into bed and take only about 30 minutes to fall asleep instead of three hours. Um, she then wakes at about 5 a.m., 
um, and stays out of bed until she feels sleepy again. Some days for her, that means she's up at five and she doesn't actually get back into bed because the sleepiness uh, isn't strong enough, but some days she can go back to bed. And with that adjustment, now she's spending, instead of 12 hours in bed, uh, she's spending six to nine hours in bed. Instead of sleeping uh, five hours, she's sleeping anywhere from five and a half to seven hours. Uh, so her total sleep time hasn't increased a ton, but her sleep efficiency has now gone from what was 40% now to what we think of as the normal or the healthy range. All right, so I'll tag out right. for a second. Yeah, um, we wanted to add this slide um, because uh, wearables um, have become very popular in recent years. And I see this in my practice a lot where people will come in and say, um, you know, I'm I'm noticing that I'm not getting enough deep sleep or I'm not getting many hours or I'm waking up 50 times per night and, and things like that. Um, so we know that at least one in 10 adults um, now owns an activity tracker. And so think of things like, you know, Fitbit or, you know, your Apple Watch or your Aura Ring, all of these things. Um, what we know, and, you know, this re research is very new and, and emerging. So, you know, this is just preliminary information, is that some of these wearables um, can be less reliable for people who generally experience more fragmented or broken up sleep. Um, so if you have difficulty sleeping uh, that looks like insomnia or people who have neurologic conditions that kind of increase the uh, wakefulness at night, um, the trackers are less reliable. Um, so one thing that I take away from this is that while these trackers can be helpful in a lot of different ways, um, you know, and different brands have different, you know, um, accuracies, what we know is that it can also increase worry about sleep, right? If you're looking at this graph and it's all kind of like alarming colors, letting you know, like, look at how little sleep you're getting. You're going to feel worried. You're going to try really hard to sleep. And what happens when we try really hard to sleep is that it doesn't work. So sleep is something that your body and the just knows how to do naturally. And we don't have much control over how that unfolds. What we do have control over is creating a good foundation for your body to be able to do its job and sleep. Um, so anyway, just a note on that and um, take the data you get from these wearables with, with a grain of salt, um, because they might not be 100% accurate. Um, it's more important to rely on how you feel. Um, and if you have a sleep disorder, of course, consulting um, with a sleep medicine specialist is your best bet. All right, next slide, please. So we wanted to give an, uh, another example of somebody uh, with sleep apnea, which is, um, Abby mentioned earlier, can be more common in people with MS. Um, so we have Arthur here, and he is a 67-year-old man, and he was diagnosed with secondary progressive MS about five years ago. He is not on any DMT or disease-modifying um, therapy. He also has other health conditions, um, including diabetes and hypertension or high blood pressure. Um, his partner has noticed that he, sna he snores very loudly. And at times she notices that he stops breathing and gasps, gasps for air. Um, sometimes he wakes up with a headache and dry mouth um, and... He noticed that he also has some tr more trouble, difficulty swallowing. He's sleeping what looks like enough hours, but he never feels rested and he can dose off um, at any time during the day. Um, let's look to the next slide, please. So what, what Arthur ended up doing is he showed a lot of symptoms that are high risk for someone with, uh, that can increase the risk of sleep apnea. So things like high blood pressure or having really severe daytime sleepiness, meaning that you're likely to doze off, you know, when you're doing quiet things or sitting in a chair and things like that, um, his partner also noticed um, the snoring and the, you know, stopping breathing while he's sleeping. So all of these kind of gave them the alert 
they needed to check with their doctor. And so they ended up recommending a sleep study. And so a sleep study is something that if uh, I'm sure... I'm sure some of you have done this before. Um, there's a couple of types of different sleep studies. You can do them in a lab uh, where they kind of hook up different machines to monitor different functions in your body, including your brain waves, your heart rate, temperature, et cetera. And by looking at your brain waves while you sleep, they can actually pinpoint if you meet criteria for a specific sleep disorder. Um, with Arthur, they found that he had about 30 pauses or cessation of breathing or drops in oxygen per hour during the sleep period that he was in the study for. So if any of you are familiar with sleep apnea, what happens is that is particularly with obstructive sleep apnea, um, when we're asleep, our um, airway ends up relaxing in a way that kind of collapses on itself. So if you can see my hands, I'm kind of mimicking what that looks like. So it relaxes fully or partially. And what that does is that it impacts your ability to breathe. Your brain doesn't like that. So your brain sends an alerting signal that can be felt either as an awakening where you end up gasping for air, or it can actually feel undetected. So this is why sleep apnea can go undiagnosed for so long, is because you don't even realize that you're waking up. But what happens is if you are stopping breathing 30 times per hour, and you sleep nine to 10 hours a night, you can do the math. Um, that's a lot of awakening. So that, of course, can impact your ability uh, to have good quality sleep, and then it affects how you feel during the day. Um, and of course, it can affect you down the road. So he ended up getting diagnosed with severe obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and he was also referred for a swallow study uh, to um, understand why he was having difficulty swallowing. Um, he was fitted for a CPAP, which is a continuous positive airway pressure. So going back to our little um, airway here, what it does is it essentially blows hair at a high pressure in your airway to keep it open so that it doesn't relax fully and collapse. Um, so that is the gold standard treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, some people may need um, a, what's called a BiPAP, and this has different types of or prescriptions um, of the air pressure that you're getting. So some people may need a higher level of pressure later in the night, and so that machine automatically adjusts as needed. Um, he ended up trying CPAP, but he couldn't adjust to the ongoing um, pressure, and he actually did better on that bi-level positive airway pressure. Um, machine. Um, so then he ended up still sleeping around nine to 10 hours per night as his usual, but he also felt more rested um, after waking. And when we say after waking, we mean like, you know, within the hour of waking, we don't normally feel super rested the moment we open our eyes, right? There's a little bit of a, um, a dimming switch, um, as Abby mentioned. Um, so I think that takes us to the end of our uh, discussion and we'll leave time for questions. But before jumping into that, um, if you're still having sleep difficulties, uh, there are a lot of behavioral strategies that can help. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the webinar, there's a lot of behavioral factors that we do to compensate for the lack of sleep that end up being counterproductive. Um, so things like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, if you've ever heard of that before, is now the gold standard recommended treatment for chronic insomnia even before medications. Um, so you can look at the National Sleep Foundation for more information on this. Um, and you can also go on this website for free CBTI if you can't find a provider um, in your area or if you prefer to try it on your own first. Um, tell your healthcare team, whether it's your primary care provider or your nurse practitioner or your neurologist and ask for referrals for a sleep med medicine specialist. If you find that you are still not feeling energy or not well during the day, even though you're getting enough hours of sleep or you're having difficulty with sleep, um, there's lots of things you can do. Um, sleep study can be an important part of that. And as I mentioned, behavioral sleep medicine, which is a whole specialty um, that is continuing to grow. 
Um, remember also that sleep is part of a 24 hour cycle. So the things that we do during the day actually help or impair your sleep at night. So making sure you get enough sunlight in the morning to help reset your circadian rhythm every day, um, exercising earlier in the day, pacing, um, monitoring naps and making sure that they're not too long and that they're timed correctly. Um, if you take naps, those types of things, those are things that are totally within your control. Um, so with that, um, I believe we have, let's see, a few minutes for questions and I'll have Tori moderate that before we, uh, I, so I know I can lose track of time very easily with this. No, you guys were great. Um, I really appreciated you um, folding people's questions into this discussion. I'm sure they really appreciated not having to wait till the end. So that was like a nice uh, surprise for some of them. So um, I can throw a couple out at you guys, but if there's any that you saw in the Q&A that you really want to address, feel free to also jump in. Um, a few different questions that were in the Q&A were about um, having to get up to uh, use the bathroom during the night and any tips and tricks when they should stop drinking water, things to kind of combat that a little bit. Yeah. So one way to approach it is to um, almost make it like part of your nighttime. Like that's what happens and kind of accepting and rather than fighting it, um, of course, avoiding, um, you know, drinking water and other beverages, you know, closer to bedtime can be an effective um, strategy for some people. But again, as we get older, it's actually quite normal to get up for the bathroom at least once or twice or more. Um, and especially if you have bladder issues as a secondary symptom of MS, this can also be normal. So kind of reassuring yourself, this is normal. It's okay that I'm getting up. Um, it's not going to be harmful um, to my health down the road. And all you have to do is come back to bed and focus on relaxing, right? not trying to sleep, but focusing on allowing your body to relax. And whether you do that by practicing some breathing exercises um, or listening to a meditation um, or doing anything else that helps your body settle, um, that's really the key is just to allow yourself to go back to bed, give yourself the opportunity. I know we mentioned the 20 minute mark for getting out of bed, um, but we also told you not to look at your clock. So it can be sometimes hard to gauge that. Um, I would say the moment that you start feeling uncomfortable being in bed in the sense that you start to get anxious or worried about going back to sleep, that would be a good time to either get out of bed. And for those of you with mobility issues, um, even switching up your position in bed or sitting up, you know, it's not as effective as getting out of bed, but it can be what you can do in that moment. And again, focusing back on relaxation so that you can lay down that foundation for sleep to keep going. I'll also add to that, um, Sam, that as much as you, if you are getting up to use the bathroom, um, as much as you can try to keep that cool, comfortable, dark environment, as long as it's still safe to mobilize in that, um, to keep your heart rate down and to not introduce additional energy expenditure, um, it may be worth having a bedside commode, for example, um, just for purposes of being able to go to uh, use the bathroom and then get back into bed uh more easily without having as much disruption, especially so that you're not navigating stairs or potentially um, bright lights. A bedside commode may not work for you or it may not be part of the routine that you want to adopt, but we try to be pretty creative in our rehabilitation uh, perspectives and units of, of doing what works for you. Awesome. Thank you both for that. Um, and you guys talked, or we had some words in the chat about sleep aids and people utilizing sleep aids. Someone specifically pointed out that they feel like they're addicted to sleep aids. Um, do you have any, you know, tips or thoughts on what to do in that case, if it's not, you know, great to rely on them, like you said? Yeah, um, this is very common. I mean, sleep aids are widely available. Um, we see melatonin being marketed for children. So, you know, it, it's kind of part of our culture um, that, you know, you can't sleep, you take a pill, you, you know, that helps you fall asleep. Uh, what we know is that it doesn't fully mimic what, you know, actual natural sleep looks like and feels like. Um, so even though it might be helpful for the short term, meaning, you know, you 
stayed up all night, um, doing an all night or studying or working or doing something and you need to uh, be able to sleep. Um, that's unlikely to lead to any long-term results. But when you start to get into what we call dependence, um, meaning that your body now starts to rely on that medication, whether it's over the counter or prescribed, um, to be able to sleep. Um, so we have Without getting into the complexities of this in general, we have these types of receptors in our brain. Um, and we, when we introduce foreign um, or artificially produced um, substances like sleep aids, your body sort of learns, oh, I don't have to make this. I don't have to make melatonin. I'm getting it you know, for free. I don't have to work hard. It kind of teaches your body that it doesn't need to basically do its job because it's getting it from the outside. Um, so that's one piece of dependence or, uh, you know, what some people can define as addiction. Um, so the key is to work with your provider to help you get on a safe paper plan, if that's your goal, um, and look at how it inter or interacts with other medications. With some prescribed sleep aids, it's really important to go on a taper plan because they can lead to, you know, negative side effects if you do it abruptly. So always, always work with your provider when it comes to sleep medications and maybe uh, take a stab at some, some of the behavioral strategies. Um, what we know is that the behavioral strategies are effective, but they take more work on our end and they take longer. So just because you do all of the right things, right, right things one night doesn't mean that you'll get good sleep that night. It, it's a culmination of um, habits um, that lead to um, more successful sleep. And I'd also be curious to hear what Abby has to say about that. But um, totally agree. The only other addition I had to say about melatonin, someone asked about melatonin dosing and I put a, a linked article in the, in the Q and a for that. Um, the other thing with melatonin is that melatonin works on our circadian rhythm as opposed to being a sleep aid. So melatonin is very different than for example, um, Ambien or other types of sleep, sedating sleep medications. But what that means, then is that oftentimes the timing of it looks different. Um, someone had mentioned that they take melatonin in the middle of the night to try to get back to sleep. Um, and, and there's a bit of a lag time. And so it's, it's actually a few hours before bed that uh, if you do take melatonin, you would want to time it more in that window um, as opposed to when you are already not able to sleep. Um, because of because of that lag time, it most likely if you're taking melatonin and then finding yourself becoming sleepy soon thereafter, um, that that actually may be a behavioral um, uh, connection that you've uh, created over time, or almost like a, a placebo effect. And the placebo effect is absolutely real. Um, and working with your provider around the dosing and the timing of that will be really important. Awesome. I think we have time for one more. Um, for anyone that is interested in getting a sleep assessment, do you have, um, you know, where they can get kind of get started with that process? Yep. The, yeah. the slides um, that, um, that I think Tori shared um, in terms of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the S Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine, all, both have directories for finding a sleep center, um, as well as uh, behavioral specialists uh, like ourselves, uh, th that's a good place to start. And um, Sam, I don't know if you have other suggestions as well. Yeah, um, you if you have insurance and you have a primary care provider, um, I would also start there. Um, and if they usually will be able to refer you to a sleep study, um, I know that there's um, a lot of new companies that are emerging that actually provide services online and, um, you know, you can do a sleep study with some of these companies. Um, it is tends to be out of pocket. Some of them are covered by insurance. So I would call your insurance plan if you have it um, or wherever you get your health care and find out what you um, can benefit from. But I think most insurance plans uh, will cover sleep study, whether it's the in-lab study that I mentioned or the take-home test that you can do. Um, so your provider will know which one will be, um, the most, most appropriate for you. So, yeah, so I would say, start with any provider that you have a good relationship with, um, and look at the resources that Abby, um, mentioned. 
Perfect. And um, like Abby said, we will share the slides tomorrow. We will send out the webinar recording as well as the slides to everyone tomorrow. So be on the lookout in your emails. You will get those as well. So thank you for answering um, you know, the Q&A and thank you for all the participants for putting those in there. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a wrap up. So now that the webinar is over, you can still connect with us on social media. We have TikTok videos that are you know, all kinds of tips and tricks and short um videos and our Facebook we have our events and things like that so make sure you stay tuned to all of our news we also have a newsletter that you can sign up for at, at candu-ms.org and I'd like to thank the sponsors one more time for making these programs possible and let you know that next month we are focusing on communication so next webinar Wednesday will be how to talk to or talk about stuff, tough stuff with important people. It's a tongue twister. Um, it's going to be November 1st, the first Wednesday as well. And we would like to also thank the um, speakers for coming tonight, for giving us their expertise. Thank you, Abby and Samantha, so much. And thank you all for joining us. There will be a survey that pops up at the end of this program. So we would love your feedback um, to help us continue to improve our program. So thank you again, Sam and Abby, for being awesome. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.